Be turned over to John chapter 13 today. John 13 is where we'll find ourselves as we look at the reconciler. That's Jesus. If we haven't already figured it out, we've been talking over the last several weeks as we look at different names of Jesus that we find in Scripture or titles that he has been referred to. And uh, so today we'll continue that series of messages, Who is Jesus? And I hope you've been enjoying it so far. I, I enjoy looking into these kinds of titles. Uh, I enjoy looking at the aspect of who he is and the nature and character of who Jesus is. And, and so I hope that that is something that you're looking forward to as well. And you dive into the scriptures on your own and you begin to seek him out and search him out. I want to take a moment also to give credit where it's due. Uh, sometime back, Trey wrote a devotion for his uh, website. And he shared it online. And uh, he came to me a few weeks ago when I began to talk about this series that we wanted to do, talking about the different titles of Jesus. And he handed me uh, about a page and a half, a little better outline. And it was from that devotion he did. And he says, I don't know if this will be of a help to you, but it would probably fit uh, this series. And so I took that and adapted it and turned it into a number of pages for a message. But I want to give him credit for his sharing those thoughts with me. And so uh, I, I get overwhelmed uh, when I see the way God works in my life, that he gives me opportunity to get up here on a weekly basis, and, and I get to share messages and just proclaim Jesus. But then to know that I'm honored that I have uh, a family that will share ministry with me, uh, boy, that overwhelms me. Um, everybody is not blessed in that way, so I want to give him all the glory for that. With that said, we're learning all, all that we can about this all-encompassing Lord that we find in Scripture and we sing about as we come into worship uh, each week. Uh, he has the ability to meet any and every need that we find ourselves facing. Often we give him all of our heavy baggage, our sicknesses, our woes, our struggles. But whatever we're needing in life, he has the ability to overcome it and challenge uh, whatever is facing us and take it on for himself so that we can be delivered through it. And our most desperate need right now is to be right with a holy God. Every one of us needs to be right with a holy God. And so Jesus has to step in uh, to our world, and, and, and he begins to minister and reconcile us to God. Because of sin, that's something that you and I can't do on our own. The Bible reminds us of that. And so Jesus, in his time, in his earthly ministry, gathers disciples, and he'll share with them, and they'll end up sharing in a continued ministry. And that's why we're here today. And, you know, there's going to be people who are going to come after you that are going to be ministering on this platform one day, and they're going to do it because of you investing in them. That's the way that God intended for his church to continue from generation to generation to generation. So it's... Jesus is with his disciples. We, we're going to read that he begins to prepare them for the time that he will be leaving. And as we mentioned last week, we, we want to begin turning our focus to Easter. We're, we're approaching quickly this Easter season. Uh, in just a short while, Jesus will be arrested and, and ultimately he will die a criminal's death on the cross. Uh, so, so Jesus is sharing with his disciples that the time is drawing near that he's going to be going away. And we find in John chapter 13, verses 36 through 38, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus already told him he's going away. Jesus replied, where, uh, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. And Jesus asked, uh, Peter asked, Lord, why can't uh, I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, today we look at Jesus as the reconciler and, and the one who, when we messed up, when we make a mess of everything, he can make it right. In, in this message, we look at a passage that reveals uh, why we need Jesus to be our reconciler. Uh, here's the reason. First of all, uh, Peter could probably be, be, be considered the most passionate of all the disciples. Uh, you compare him to the other 11 at the time, and he, he probably had the, the highest of high moments. He was in the clouds, but in his low moments, uh, he was down in his depths. Uh, here's just one example 
that takes place, one of his highest moments that he could ever think about in his life, and yet find one of the lowest moments just like that. In, in Matthew chapter 14, we read in verses 22 through 23, During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water, and he came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and called him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? He went from saying, God... It, Jesus, if, if this really you, I, I want to come right where you are. Let me get out and walk on this water. And Jesus says, well, come on. He steps out of his boat, starts walking. Everything's going good. But he saw something that he couldn't see. The Bible says he saw the wind. Have you ever seen the wind? You may feel the wind. You may see the effects of the wind. But something you can't see is the wind, right? It's an invisible thing. The, the word there takes us back to the original language of what? Pneuma, breath, blow, air circulating. Every one of you takes a breath, and all I can see is the motion that maybe comes from that. But the Bible says that when he had Jesus before him, he had been so focused on him, he was terrified, thinking it was a ghost. And when Jesus confirms it's him, he says, well, you come on out here then. And he walks and he takes his focus off Jesus and he looks at something he can't see and he gets distracted and he begins to sing. Now, one of the highest, of the high moments of somebody's life and also in that same situation, one of the lowest moments he could ever find himself in. At times, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of in-between with Peter. But nevertheless, there's one thing that's for certain. He did love Jesus. Uh, this would be the reason that he, he would rise to fame so quickly in Christianity. It was also the reason that he would end up being a future martyr for the faith. The events of the passage in John 13 occurred while Jesus was addressing his disciples before his crucifixion. The Lord told them that they could not follow him where they were going right now, but one day you would. Now, this following could either have been their own future experience of dying as martyrs, all exception of John, that's what they all died of, or of them dying and going to their future glory in heaven with Jesus. That's what we all look forward to, isn't it? We all want to go to heaven, but most people don't want to go right now. If I could ask you that question, if you could say, I will take my last breath right now and go to heaven to be with Jesus, how many of you would throw your hand up and say, let me go? Not a lot of us would want to make that choice, would we? We may think we would want that to happen. We want to go and be with Jesus, but we just don't want to make that decision right now. Why? Because there may be something that we're missing out here, or maybe we're not ready for there. And too many times it's more about I'm not ready for there than it is I'm missing something here. So that's where we find ourselves. And as we have been saying over the last few weeks, Jesus is the, the only one who can be able to take away the sins of mankind and satisfy God's requirement for the sin that we have. And what our sins deserve, the Bible says, is death. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. I had a conversation yesterday with a relative. We began to talk about uh, loss of jobs and things that were going on in his life and one of the things we mention is that the sin that we have in our life, well, it deserves. We always look at rewards and punishment, don't we? And here, the wage that we deserve for the sin that we commit, the Bible says, is death. But the reward is, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the reason he came. He came to reconcile us to God. There's nothing we could do. What we're doing is going to bring death. But what Jesus did will bring life. You can only imagine why Peter would make such a bold claim to follow Jesus to the death. He, he had left his family. He left his business, business as a fisherman. He, he, he's left his home and everything he knew to follow Jesus. He, he had some stake in the game, so to speak, right? 
To use a more modern term, he, he had a vested interest. Uh, he, he had made personal sacrifices to, to, to move up the ladder, so to speak, in his relationship with Jesus. Maybe that's the reason Peter asked in John chapter 13, verse 37, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'd lay down my life for you. Peter's looking for a reason. I, I can understand that, and I'm sure you can. I, I mean, you just think of working a career for a few years. and You, you get into maybe you, teaching, or you work for a corporation, and they say after a number of years, you become vested in your career. And, and as you vest in your career, in whatever it is that you do, it, it gives you a certain amount of security and privilege and and if there was ever going to be a layoff or a cutback, you would probably be one of the latter ones that would be, be, be let go because you vested in that organization. And so maybe there were times where all the opportunities come along and, and, and you said, no, I'm not going to walk away from this. I'm too close to being vested. You sacrifice, you sacrifice sleep. You, you put in hard work. You... You, you struggled financially because maybe there were some quicker ways to have some other opportunities to quit quicker gain. But, but because you knew that one day you would become vested, then you stuck around. But then what would happen if after putting in all that, one day they walk, to you, walk up to you, you think everything's going well, and, and they're getting ready to say, you know what, you finally have reached this goal you've been working toward. But instead of handing you accommodation, they hand you a pink slip. And what they end up saying is something to this effect. We're moving on without you. That's the way Peter's feeling at this moment. When Jesus is getting ready to tell them, hey, look, I'm getting ready to go away. There's something getting ready to take place here. And where I'm going, you can't go, but you can go later. He's like, wait a minute, I put in three years of my life. I'm vested. And Jesus says, well, you, you may think so. But where I'm getting ready to go, you're not ready for. And so maybe that's what Peter felt in this moment. But Peter is missing the reason for Jesus telling him why he did what he did. The whole reason Jesus came into this messed up world was to reconcile us to God. And that was something that he would have to bear on his own alone. Peter weren't going to be able to do that. You see, the, the reason then is our sin and only our sin will be something Jesus has to face on his own. And he's the only one that will be able to make an account for it before God. Well, what's the result then? Well, we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Now, as we reflect back on the passage in John chapter 15, or 13, excuse me, we see Jesus also knew the truth. You know Jesus knows the truth about you. We, we, we play a good game sometimes. We can present ourselves in a certain way or in certain situations. But Jesus knows the truth. He, he knew that though Peter had good intentions, he would not be able to deliver on his promises. You've been there, haven't you? I've been there. There's been times I've had good intentions to do something for the Lord or do something for somebody God has placed in my life, but there come a point where I say, you know what, I'm not really able to follow through with that promise that I made. Well, what promise is Jesus talking about here? Well, Peter says in verse 37 of John 13, I will lay down my life for you. That was the promise he was making. And Jesus said, you're not going to be able to follow through with that. And as we mentioned earlier, in essence, I, I guess we could say that he already had. He, he, he left everything he'd known, and his day-to-day -day life changed, and he's chosen to follow Jesus. And, and, and so he thinks he's given up his life. But Jesus knows he's getting ready to face this death, and Peter's not going to be able to go where he's going. So that's not what Jesus was getting at when he says, will you really lay down your life for me? Yeah, you, you left your home and your, your, your business and your day-to-day -day life and maybe your station of what you had begun to work your way up a ladder somewhere, but, but that's not what I'm getting at. 
Those are things God calls us into a relationship to do on a daily basis. But would you really lay down your life for Jesus? The Lord knew that Peter would deny him three times. And, and, and that's exactly what Peter did. We could go back and read all about that in Luke chapter 22, verses 54 and following. We can learn more about him. But, but here's what's happening after Peter denied Jesus by the early morning hours. In Luke twenty two sixty two, it says that he went out and he wept bitterly. Why? Because he knew he couldn't follow through with the promise he made that, Lord, I'd give my life for you. I think something we all need to be able to gather in ourselves is, God, if I'm going to commit my life to you, I need to be willing to give my life for you. And a lot of people struggle with that. That's just like us. We, we can have the zeal and such passion to live for God, but then when we hit a bump in the road, everything falls apart. We have these good intentions, but we can't always keep the promises we make to God. Making promises to God is not always a good thing. If we're honest, we, we probably have all done it in one form or another along the way. We make jokes about it. You know, God, if you just get me out of this situation, I'll go to church every Sunday. You ever done that? I need to get my life right. And if God, if you'll just help me get out of this bad situation I'm in, I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to attend Sunday school. I'm going to give an extra offering. I'm going to do, I mean, we just start naming. We just want out of the mess that we're in right at that moment, don't we? And so if you'll just get me out of this mess that I can get out of right now and make it better, I'll be happy. And I'll give you whatever you want. I told you before, I've had people walk in that door, and they, they would ask for some type of assistance. And often it's something we can't fulfill for them. And I would tell them, I said, well, you know, we really can't. We don't keep cash laying around, or we don't whatever. But some people are pretty slick. They know that I'm a preacher. Can I talk to the preacher? I said, well, I'm the preacher. Oh, well, well I, then I need to get my life right with, with the Lord. They want to get right with God, and then hopefully by them telling me that they're going to give me what they think me as a preacher wants, I want everybody to be saved. Well, I'll just tell them I want to get right with God. I'll get right with the Lord, and then he's going to give me what I'm asking for. And as you've heard me say, that's often just us pimping out our salvation. And a lot of people do that. Oh, God, if you'll just get me out of this situation. Oh, God, if you'll just heal this, whatever it is in my body, I, I promise I'm going to live for you. I'm going I'm to turn my life around. Oh, God, if you just help me out of this bad relationship, I promise. I promise. He knows we can't follow through on many of those promises. So we have these good intentions, but we can't follow through. And so making these promises is not always a good thing. There's a man in the Bible named Jephthah. And we find him in the Old Testament book of Job, uh, Judges. And he went, went up against the Ammonites in battle. And the Spirit of the Lord, now this is what the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord was with him. It was with him already. Keep that in mind, okay? But he promises the Lord that if he would grant him, speaking of the Lord, victory uh, in this battle that he's getting ready to go into, that he was sacrificed to the Lord as a burnt offering, uh, whatever came out of his house to meet him when he returned home in triumph over the Ammonites. And here's what the Bible says. Now, maybe he's like me. I've got a nice little dog at home now. And maybe he's thinking, well, you know, he's got, back then, it wasn't uncommon for people to bring their livestock in the house and in their tent. And, and so maybe he's thinking one of those are going to walk out. But listen to what we read in Judges chapter 11, verses 34 and 35. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? Dancing to the sound of tambourine. She's excited daddy's coming home in victory, right? She's celebrating. She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter, you have made me miserable and wretched because I've made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. 
Could you imagine being in that situation? Many of us would not follow through, would we? Now, you go back and read Jephthah's story and read about his daughter. She learns that he's made this promise, and she's going to help him fulfill his vow. And all she asked for was a, a couple of months to go up in the hillside with her friends, her girlfriends, and just dance and sing and enjoy life. And she just says, you know, after all, I'll never be able to have children. I'm, I'm a virgin. I'm, and so they, he says he grants that, and she comes back, and for all we know, that's what took place. But the Bible says that Jephthah had the Spirit of the Lord upon him, signifying that God's already with him. God's already with you. And too many times we think, God, if you'll just be with me, if you'll just help me, I promise. God says, I've already been here. I was trying to get you out of this mess before you got yourself in it. That's why I'm here. And the result of what you're going through is because you're making these bad choices. And that's the reason you need somebody to reconcile what you're, you've done with me because you can't fix it. And here's the thing. The promise that Jephthah made to the Lord didn't have to be made at all. He already had what he was wanting from the Lord from the beginning. God's with you. But too many times we make choices or we make decisions or we do something or we say something that we can't follow through with. So instead of having to sacrifice the first thing that walks out of my door to, when I mess up, and I say, God, the first, the first thing that walks out of my door to greet me when I get home because I've committed this sin or I'm going through this trial or whatever, I'm going to sacrifice that to you. I don't have to worry about getting rid of my wife or my son or even my dog. Because Jesus has already taken that sacrifice upon himself and become that sacrifice. And so God told us here that making these promises to him is not always the best thing, especially if you can't keep them. Peter wasn't prepared to keep his promise to Jesus in John chapter 13. Jesus told him, will you really lay down your life for me in verse 38? And he's asking you and me the same question. And I know there's many of us today, and there's many times in our life when we have these good, noble intentions to follow Jesus, and we say, we'll follow you anywhere until things get difficult. And we generally want to honor the Lord, but the result of our choices and the difficulty of following through, getting the way of honoring God. And so often the result of our good intentions are these failed promises that we make. And we need someone to come who can reconcile us to God. And so we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When God stands and looks at us and sees everything we've gone through, Jesus can step in front of him and he sees his own righteousness reflecting back at him. He's the one who reconciles us to God. That brings us to our final point, this reconciliation. That's what a reconciler does. He brings the reconciliation between you and God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And although we may fall short, and though we may have these good intentions of keeping promises to God, he can still use us, even though we mess up. I received a call this week, and I talked with a young man. He's just trying to move up in his life and be closer to God, and wants to serve God in ministry in some way. And he's got a checkered past and I can hold it against him but God's moving in his life right and I could always look and say well you because you did this you'll never be able to do that or I can say here is what God's doing in your life move forward in it serve him be faithful watch him grow in his own time in your life and watch what he'll do with you and too many of us don't want that time period of reconciliation. God is working. And God can still use us when we mess up. 
And, and his grace is there to redeem us. And Jesus gave himself as a ransom. The Bible uses that word ransom. You, you were held hostage by something and you had to be bought out of it. And Jesus was your ransom for all the junk that you tend to collect in your life. We've been living in our house now for seven and a half years. And the house was originally built to have a couple more rooms and a bathroom upstairs. It's not finished. It's just built and laid out that way. The walls are there. Rough plumbing's there. All the electrical is there. We just don't need all the space. So we use it as an attic. You can imagine the stuff that's been collecting up there, the junk. For seven and a half years. We started out saying after moving here, being in the place where we were at for nine years and cleaning all that out, we said we're not going to let this junk collect like we did before. So we, we hauled off truckloads. We gave stuff away. We, we did everything we could not to bring any more than what we had to when we came. But now when you open the door, well, we've got junk everywhere. So Amy is like, we need to make time in the last several months she's like we need to take some time before it gets real hot and and go up there and and just clean out and get rid of stuff we don't need and organize and and i have to be honest i'm as guilty as the next there'll be times i say yep we'll do it on tuesday we'll take an hour two hours whatever we're just biting it off you know how you eat an elephant one bite at a time right you're not gonna try to do it all at one time one whack and maybe tuesday's not a good day I've dealt with so much other junk throughout the day, I don't feel like dealing with my junk. You understand? And then maybe Thursday comes and we plan to do it, and maybe Amy's not feeling up to, she's had a tough day, and she's not feeling up to dealing with her junk, and Trey's not up to dealing with his junk on whatever day. And then somebody, when it's all said and done, when we finally get around to it, we also got to figure out what we're going to do with all our junk because somebody has to be willing to take it away and get rid of it, right? Because if we don't immediately get rid of it, what's going to happen? We're just going to hold on to our junk, and it's going to find its way back somewhere else. Friends, that's what Jesus came into the world to do. He come in to, as you recognize your junk, and you have to clean up stuff, and you have to get rid of it, and you, you keep the things that are worth keeping, and the stuff that is no longer any good for you, or it is actually a detriment to who you are as a follower of Jesus, you get rid of it, but you give it to him, and he gets rid of it for you. You don't have to keep holding on to it, bringing it back. And so he reconciles our life to God and to himself. Romans chapter 5, verses 10 through 11 says, For if we, when we were God's enemies... Where we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. In essence, what's he saying? Boil it down into one little short sentence. He gets rid of the junk. And after Jesus has risen from the grave, he went to his disciples one day while they're fishing. And, and he calls out to them, as John would record for us. And then he says, John himself says, it's the Lord, when he hears them calling out. And as soon as Peter heard that it was the Lord, you know what he does? He jumps up, he he, he, he takes his outer garment off. He wraps it around his waist. He dives in the water. He doesn't even want to wait for the boat to row, row back to shore. He swam to Jesus to get to him as close and, and as quickly as he possibly could. He couldn't get to him fast enough. And friends, if you've ever been in a relationship with Jesus and something happened where you felt like you got him further and further away from him, and you get to the point where you know that it's time to get back to him. If I could just make it right with God, and he presents himself in that opportunity, what are you going to do? You better make every effort you can as quickly as you can to get to him. That's what Peter did. He's denied Jesus. The Bible says it hurt him so bad that he went out and wept bitterly, and he's even began to return to the life that he knew before. He's gone back to maybe his junk, stuff that was familiar to him. 
Jesus tells them, bring me some fish. They'd already caught some. And who's the one who grabbed the net? Peter. You want fish, Lord? I got fish. You just name which one you want. I wonder if he was yearning for a second chance with Jesus. And as they sat there on this beach, Jesus asked Peter if he loved him three times. And each time, Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. Lord, you know I love you. Why did you ask me? And each time he would say, feed my sheep. Take care of them. There was no more question. He knew exactly what Jesus wanted him to do. Maybe he asked him three times, did he love him? One for each time that he denied him. I wonder for as many times as we've denied Jesus, does he ask you, do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you love me? Because the Bible said he loved us enough that he went to a cross for us. He died to pay for the sin that I deserve. I'm a preacher. But before I was a preacher, I was lost. And yet the Bible says no matter who we are, we're all sinners. And so Jesus says every day, Dan, do you love me? Do you really love me? Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. It's a lot of work. They won't eat what you try to feed them. They want to graze in a different pasture. They're hanging out with the wolves. And Jesus says, Dan, do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. And I'm reminded that I have rejected him and I have denied him just like Peter did. And yet he restored me and he encourages me and he empowers me to minister to his church. I sat through two hours yesterday listening to somebody say everything they knew about the Bible. And I was like, man, he just don't know. He's still not getting Jesus. He's still not getting Jesus. I could care less about what you know about the Bible if you don't know Jesus. And too many people are wor more worried about what you know about the Bible or what, and you think you need to share everything you need that, that you have knowledge-wise. But what they really need to know is, all right, I'm going to get in Jesus, and then he's going to help me clear up this stuff. He's going to reconcile my knowledge of God. He's going to reconcile my relationship with God. He's going to reconcile my eternity with God. And all the other stuff, he'll fill in the blanks as I need them. Every week I give you a fill in the blank. One word. Maybe two. I don't want to bombard you with stuff. And I give it to you simply because people ask me for it. And all we're doing is reconciling the empty spots. And Jesus says I've come so I can reconcile the empty spots that you have with God. You see, God can use any of us even though we've fallen short of his glory, as Scripture reminds us. He, he can show you the same grace that he showed Peter and he showed me. He reinstated Peter. He, he, he can do the same thing in your life. I don't know if you're a person who's gotten away from Jesus, but he says, I just need you to come back, sit down with me a little while, let's have a, a brief conversation. And all I'm going to ask you is, do you love me? 
And all you got to do is say what? Yes, Lord. I love you. What does the reconciler do? He can use the imperfect people to carry out his perfect message of reconciliation to other folks. Even when our good intentions have resulted in these failed promises, God says, I can make something out of them. The Bible says he never leaves us nor forsakes us. Peter walked away from Jesus that night. Jesus didn't walk away from him. And if you've done that, there's good news. This is the time of reconciliation. We're getting ready to have our invitation song. If you've never accepted Jesus and you say, man, today's my day. I mean, this, this message, he's, Jesus is calling me. He, he wants me, and I want to have him. I want you to respond in this time. This is your time to be reconciled to God. Where all men should be known and be reconciled to the Lord. And so you need to know this. And you're going to come during this time of invitation. As, as our folks lead us in this song. And as we sing along. And as we prepare our hearts. We're going to talk about being redeemed. We're not going to hold on to the old stuff. We're going to get rid of it. And we're going to say, God, move me forward to be the person you want me to be. And then use me. And if we can turn ourselves over to him during this time. We will be renewed and changed in a way that we never thought we could be. I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then maybe you need to accept Christ. You're going to come forward. You're going to, I'm going to be right here to receive you. You just stop right here, and we'll get together. We'll pray. You share whatever's on your heart about receiving Jesus, or if you're a person who just says, I just want to rededicate my life. I, there's some things I need to reconcile with God. I, I will wait for you, and I will pray with you. And Or if you're a person who's like some others recently have just come and you're like, man, I'm, I need to be a part of this body of believers. I want to join this body of believers and I, I need to grow in Christ. And if you're already a believer in Christ, you've been immersed into Christ, we would receive you. But if you're missing a step, we can help you get there. If you just step out and express that desire. Whatever you're needing, let God lead you in this time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our your love and your mercy. We praise you for what you're doing for us in this assembly today. And thank you for your Holy Spirit, the way you work within us, and the way you want to move within us. And thank you, God, that we can be people who know that when we could not fix whatever it was that was going on in our life, Jesus stepped in to reconcile it between us and you. So now, God, as we surrender ourselves in this time, let us not be in your way, Holy Spirit, as you move us. Let us be yielding to whatever you want to do in our lives and in our assembly today. And thank you, God, that if we're the people who knew you already and have been walking and, and, and got a message earlier in the song that I'm not who I once was. I'm not who I want to be, but I'm still not who I once was. I can get closer even in this time. We can do that. We praise you for who you are, Lord Jesus, that when we couldn't fix the mess that we've made, you can say, I can straighten it all out. Oh, Lord, may you step into our lives at this moment. We're praying it in Jesus' name. Amen.